Hello, everyone. Today on The Final Bar, we will wrap this week. Kind of an acceleration to the downside going into the close here on Friday during our shortened holiday week. We'll try to unpack a lot of stocks on the move, names like Rivian and others. Nice move to the upside, but overall, sort of a risk-off feel during the day, but accelerating in the afternoon, going lower into the close. Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the chief market strategist here at StockCharts.com in a sunny Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the activity in the markets using the best practices of technical analysis. Our Stock Charts platform is really designed to empower you to better understand the markets by analyzing them using the language of technical analysis, the language of price, breadth, sentiment, trend, and momentum. On this show every day after the close, we try to break down as many of those different components as we can, focus on the sort of big picture takeaways, try to help you understand and illuminate the markets as they, uh, as they evolve real time, day in and day out. As a reminder, we have a lot of great educational resources, most of them available for absolutely free. So go to our chart school portion of the Stock Charts website if you want to learn more about this technical toolkit, some of the specific tools and techniques you can use to make better decisions as a technically oriented investor. Now, today's sort of an interesting day. I was sort of preparing a couple hours ago to think about sort of the overall uh, strength versus weakness in the market, potential for a rotation to the downside. As we're getting ready to go on uh, with the show here going into 4 p.m. Eastern, we get this rollover effect. I feel like a lot of the conversations we've had over the last couple of weeks all sort of manifesting themselves right at once. So we'll talk about sort of this rollover, uh, this acceleration to the downside going into the close what this actually meant in terms of the short-term picture, the likelihood of a further deterioration, but also some of the big picture trends as well. So we're going to get here in a moment to our Wrap the Week segment. Let's wrap it up. But first, I want to go to a poll. We always have a poll going on our social media accounts, also on our YouTube channel. So make sure you subscribe there and you won't miss a thing. We asked you recently, will sell in May and go away be good advice for investors in 2023? Simple question. Yes or no? And the reason why we ask this question now in July, why is this still relevant? We have to remember that this is playing on the seasonal tendencies of May through October, which is the weakest six months of the year versus November through April, which is the strongest six months of the year. So sell in May and go away really implies if you sold in May, you're still kind of out all the way through the fall. And so this is kind of the sweet spot. What's interesting is the market has actually pushed higher uh, while uh, while, while uh, this uh, seasonal weaker period has been progressing. You know, what would I say versus yes versus no? I'd say a strong yes would be my guess, um, mainly because I think either this deterioration we see now is the beginning of something more significant, and all of a sudden we have this very unusual but gradual decline through the summer, or we have another bounce higher. Either way, I think this sets us up for a pretty serious low going into September, October. If you missed my conversation with uh, Marianne Bartels yesterday, really interesting. I mean, a far-ranging conversation. We touched on a lot of things in about 12 minutes, uh, but she made some comments similar to that, thinking about a potential low in the fall, what that might mean for growth stocks between now and then. So if you missed that uh, interview, make sure you go back and, uh, and listen to Marianne Bartels. Let's keep on racking, wrapping the week here. Look at what happened uh, in the markets today. I had this picture of the Qs up just to show you. This is a five-minute chart of the uh, QQQ just to show you sort of the tale of two markets. Uh, between about open and 1.30 p.m. Eastern, not bad. And as I'm preparing for the show here a couple hours ago, I'm thinking, all right, this is a nice sort of, you know, bounce higher, continuing uh, Thursday's move. You know, maybe this is sort of maybe my assumptions that uh, that uh, the price weakness is uh, is sort of uh, happening and progressing. Maybe that's not uh, the right play. Uh, certainly feel a little more validated here in the last couple hours as things just sort of turned on the dime and rotated lower. Now, we have had some economic data uh, earlier uh, today and, and through the course of this week. And I feel like, again, if you if you ever get lulled into this sense that the market's sort of totally comfortable with things like inflation and what the Fed might do and all of that, I would say we are one. We are, this is a trigger happy market. And I would say this uh, at all times. I, I feel an underlying anxiety that I don't think is being reflected in, in the low volatility uptrend that we've seen. I think a day like today sort of shows that uh, in a big way. Very easy for this market to go from what seems like a very attractive upswing with the uh, Qs going above 370. By the close, we're actually back below uh, almost to 366. 
uh, going into, uh, and again, finishing at the lows of the day. Let's look at the dashboard, just sort of get a sense of how this played out and uh, what was going on here. So the S&P finishes down about 0.3%, uh, just below 4,400. NASDAQ composite down about 0.1%. The NASDAQ 100, similar to the S&P, down about 0.4%. Mid caps and small caps actually higher. So this is one of those days where the growthy stuff was rotating lower in a lot of ways. Um, the, uh, our growth-oriented benchmarks, our large-cap benchmarks, rotating lower. Mids and smalls doing a little bit better. The S&P 600 bouncing back up to uh, 1,200. And you can see what types of sectors we're leading. is what we call the MEI sectors, things like materials, energy, and industrials uh, making the difference. And when those sectors are leading, that means the mid and, and particularly the small cap uh, indexes are most likely going to outperform uh, the large cap indexes like the S&P and the NASDAQ. The VIX has actually pushed lower today, so volatility uh, continuing to come off a bit. This is after bouncing higher uh, earlier this week, just below 15. It pushed above 15 uh, yesterday's close. Now we're dropping back below. And again, still relatively low volatility uh, relative to the norm that we've experienced over the last 12 to 18 months. Let's go to the fixed income markets and see where things are at. We've had rates overall moving higher through the course of, uh, of the week here. Ten-year yields finishing a little bit higher yet again, but not by much. 4.1%, uh, we'll call it, 405 on the 10-year yield. The 30-year 30 uh, 30 yield, about the same. Five-year yield, the highest, around 434. And, of course, the short-term yields, the short end of the curve, still pretty elevated. So we still have that inverted yield curve. Bond prices, the TLT, coming down through the course of the day, uh, down about 0.6%. And the dollar index is down about 0.8%. That's using the UUP. Now, I wouldn't be too worried about the dollar yet, only because if you look at today's move within the context of the overall trend, the dollar overall has been more in a basing pattern, more of a consolidation phase, really not breaking yet. I would be more concerned about the movement of the fixed income markets in terms of actionable changes this week because you're seeing a big move higher in interest rates, which is something we really haven't seen. Bond prices breaking down, not just moving lower, but really breaking down through uh, key trend line support. Commodities almost finished all in the green, but a couple like natural gas actually pushed lower. Gold and silver prices higher, and that's sort of a contrarian move versus what's happened uh, in recent weeks uh, where gold and silver prices have come off. GLD is actually bouncing off of a potentially key support level. I'll show that chart here in a few moments if I can remember to do so. Uh, but gold and silver doing fine. The broader commodity ETF, the DBC doing well, and oil prices, crude oil prices moving higher, pushing the energy sector to the top of the return list today. Bitcoin and Ethereum recovering nicely after uh, deterioration here in the last uh, day or two. Bitcoin price is currently just below 30230 That's up about 1% from yesterday. Ether about 1864 That's up about half a percent from yesterday. Uh, Sector-wise, as I mentioned, MEI at the top, that's materials, energy, and industrials. The XLE, the best performer, up about 2.2%. The materials sector, the XLB, also up pretty nicely, about 0.9%. Industrials, third from the top, about a quarter of a percent. Everything else flat to down. The worst performers, some fairly defensive sectors today, 1.3% lower for the consumer staples group. Uh, XLP, healthcare down 1.2%. Utilities and REITs finishing off third and fourth from the bottom. Let's look briefly at a chart of the S&P 500. Then we'll look at the weekly returns uh, very briefly and just see what sort of conclusions we can draw here. So the S&P, right, what's happening? So today you sort of get this further deterioration, sort of a tough call on what to call this candle pattern. Um, but I would probably consider it a shooting star given that we're really near the highs. And I still think of this uptrend as sort of the overarching trend. So think about what happened today. We opened, we traded higher we saw in the um, five-minute chart of the queues earlier in the in the uh, in the show, uh, sort of this you know V inverted V, right? The rally through about 1:30 p.m. Eastern, the rotation lower going into the close. That creates this sort of candle, which is probably I'd probably best label it a shooting star candle, which is in an uptrend. You have an open higher trade, and then it closed back at the lows. And what's interesting is on an intraday basis, we got right up to. The highs for the year, just below 4450. Pretty interesting that we rally up to the high for the year, and that's where no more buyers are gone, right? The buyers are exhausted. There's an exhaustion of demand, and all of a sudden the price rotates lower. That's not a great look going into the weekend. It really suggests some further weakness in the next one to three bars. So that tells me the beginning of next week. Brace, uh, brace ourselves for continued uh, further deterioration, likely after this sort of uh, pattern on the S&P. You also notice this bearish diversion. So we've highlighted on this show, I've highlighted on my YouTube channel called Market Misbehavior, charts like Amazon and LRCX and so many others that are showing that bearish divergence. Higher highs in price, 
lower peaks in RSI. That's a common technique or a common uh, indication that's very prevalent uh, often at the end of a bull move, right? You sort of keep going higher and higher, but at some point the momentum starts to dissipate, and that's what creates that bearish momentum divergence. I would argue we're seeing that in the S&P now with a, uh, an overbought condition in mid-June, not overbought there at the uh, end of June, beginning of July. Now we're maybe rotating down to the, to the downside. I think we're setting up pretty well for, uh, for further downside going into next week. Now, that would be validated, that sort of bearish thesis, if and when we break below 4,300. And as we mentioned, that's sort of the line in the sand that I'd be watching. We have the swing low around 43.25. Uh, that's also the August 2022 highs. That's the upper end of this pink shaded area. The bottom's a big round number, around 4,300. And I would say holding that pretty important next week. Can we pull back to that sort of level? Pull back to a 50-day moving average, not too far below. That's a pretty classic pullback within an uptrend. We break those sorts of support levels. That's where we have to look a lot further down. We have to start looking at trend line support. We have to start looking at uh, bigger picture uh, Fibonacci levels to look at and, and anticipate where we might find a uh, further bottom. I wouldn't be surprised if 4,300 does not hold and we continue to push lower, but I will patiently wait for the price to tell me that there is something worth paying attention to. Let's look at the wrap the week chart. I might need to tweak this a little bit. Yeah, so we had sort of some weird, uh, it's kind of a crazy week here. So I don't feel particularly comfortable showing this only because we had, uh, you know, last Friday and then we had a half day Monday. We had a holiday here in the middle and then we're getting to here. But we still let's look at what happened uh, from last Friday's close to this Friday's close. And the answer is the S&P down not too much, about 1.1% uh, after all is said and done through the course of this shortened holiday week. Uh, small caps, the IWM, which is the Russell 2000 ETF, finished the week down 1.4%. In red, we have bond prices down 3.5%. Out of all the things that I'm going to, uh, that we mentioned and we covered through the course of this week, I think the conversation about higher rates and lower yields, excuse me, higher rates and lower bond prices, I think could be one of the more important ones. That sort of rising rate environment, elevated interest rates, is an environment that many of us have not dealt with. And I think that's been a surprising sort of factor in your analysis that you may have underplayed. Played probably as you're uh, breaking down your own uh, your own uh, analytic uh, an analytics. Let's continue on here with the rest of the uh, asset classes, all outperforming the S and P. Uh, some not by much. So you have here uh, the Nasdaq 100. Uh, we have uh, Bitcoin finishing down about 0.7 percent. The dollar. Uh, this is emerging markets, both down about half a percent. Gold finishing narrowly in the uh, green, up 0.2 percent. And the big winner, crude oil prices, up 3.6 percent. A lot of that came in today's session, as you saw further push higher. And again, the energy sector having a decent end uh, to the week. Just to look briefly, we don't have a chart. Uh, chan no, we do. Why not? Uh, we'll get back to gold later. Gold overall has pulled back, and I think we may be finding a bottom. I think one of my three and three charts is gold, so I'll, I'll save my full argument for the three and three at the end of the show here. Let's look at some individual stocks on the move. Rivian continuing to push to the upside. Uh, you're seeing, uh, I think that was an upgrade. It was a sell side upgrade that pushed uh, Rivian a little bit higher. So, you know, what do you do with a chart like this? Well, if you bought back here, you're probably really happy because you're sort of riding these, these gains. And I think there are a lot of signs that the picture has changed. What's really interesting after an IPO, and when, particularly when you start to have these uh, longer term trends that, uh, that sort of manifest over time, is when you have a stock that IPO'd and then overall has been deteriorating, which is kind of what Rivian and a lot of similar names have done, uh, you know, sort of have this rotation lower, but eventually you find a footing. You put in a higher low, you break above trend line support. We talked about it back here. I remember uh, looking at it back here where we had that initial break of a trend line. You take this high and the sub subsequent highs in 2022. The first half we broke above, and that was a nice sort of basing pattern. Really didn't make much headway on the upside. But then we reinitiated the downtrend. Take this chart, or even take a weekly chart. You can see this nice, beautiful long-term trend line that sort of lines up with where we were in early June. We broke above there, pulled back, and now it's off to the races to, uh, to the upside. The challenge for a chart like Rivian is look to the left, and you can see some pretty significant uh, resistance levels or potential uh, areas of resistance. This is an area at which Rivian has topped out before. The other thing we can do is do more of a long-term analysis, right? So take the all-time high soon after the IPO, take the all-time low here in April. 
it shows you because of the sell-off, the depth of the deterioration in Rivian, there's a ton of upside using Fibonacci analysis because just to get to 38.2% of the way back, you have to go all the way up to 76. That's a triple beyond what we've already gained. So Fibonacci retracements may not be the best measure in this sort of environment just because of the depth and the consistent downtrend that we've seen. I would be looking to the left of some of these previous highs. $40 is right at the high from August and September of last year. I think that's your upside uh, trajectory for now until proven otherwise. And watch the uh, overbought conditions. We're extremely overbought, which actually usually ends up being long-term, a little more positive than, uh, than negative, but certainly getting in the short-term some overextended readings uh, from a chart like Rivian. DraftKings, D-K-N-G, excuse me, uh, also moving to the upside. Nice update, up almost 6% today. Again, what's interesting about a chart like DraftKings, two, two things that I will tell you. Number one, this move today is just the latest move within the context of a pretty strong chart. And I think one of the levels to certainly pay attention to is this one right here. Take the August 2022 high. This is one of those stocks, and there's many of them out there that had um, a similar, very parallel, uh, sort of even level from the August 2022 high to the February 23 high, right? You can see they're about the same level. Here we have the shallower pullback. Does this pattern look familiar with the big rounded bottoming pattern? And then this shallower pullback. This is so horribly drawn, David. Come on. Then there's the, uh, the handle here in the cup and handle pattern. So if you've seen this one before, we highlighted some of these. Uh, one of these uh, this week, we had a, another example of a, a cup and handle pattern. You find them often. And again, the classic move is you move higher. We sort of have this bottoming, rounded bottoming pattern. You have a shallower pullback and then a break to the upside. This is one we highlighted earlier in the year. And you can see it's continued to follow through. So this, this move higher, where we're up almost five, uh, over 5% today, is just the latest move within the context of a stock that is emerging from a base pretty successfully. If there's a cause for concern here, it's that every new high here over the last six weeks has been on lower momentum. And again, DraftKings is one of those many names that while the price is going higher, it's suggesting a deterioration in momentum. It's just less confidence, in my opinion, on the sustainability of an uptrend when you have that sort of divergence with higher highs in price, lower peaks of momentum. I think that's a cautionary uh, tale to watch for there. Levi Strauss is another one in the uh, in the newsstand, picking up some of the names that were uh, big movers today, just to sort of see uh, what was what. Levi's gapping lower today, down about seven point seven percent. And again, what uh, and, and again, what I was highlighting with DraftKings is while today's move is important, what's more important to me is the is the trend, the longer term trend, which has been positive. So a big move higher on a chart like DraftKings makes sense because the overall impulse direction is higher. The opposite of that, flip that upside down, and that's what you get with Levi Strauss right now. You're actually seeing the price deteriorate. We're seeing lower lows and lower highs. And with the gap lower, we're back to the May 2023 low. So I'm concerned about the fact that we had gapped lower, but I'm way more interested in the fact that the trend overall has been lower. We attempted to get above the 200-day moving average there in the first quarter, failed in a number of attempts to push uh, much higher. Now we're retesting the lows. These lows may hold. I am super happy waiting for a rotation, waiting for a sign that buyers are emerging. Could be a double bottom. I think the chart will indicate when that happens and look at the RSI that is very close to that oversold level. That's it for our Wrap the Week segment. A lot of charts to cover. And again, a lot of interesting divergences, a lot of movements uh, to pay attention to. And I encourage you to use our scan engine, uh, use the chart list feature to really make sure you're staying on top of these developments during a fairly uh, busy time in, uh, in market history. We're going to open the final bar mailbag here in a few moments. Before we do it, just a couple quick announcements. First off, we welcome your questions. Our mailbag is fueled by people like you that are sending in questions. And uh, the best way to get your questions to us is via email, thefinalbar at stockcharts.com. We're also on the Twitters. At Final Bar SCTV is our handle. Just ping us on any questions that you have. Or on YouTube, just put the comment below the video that you're watching on our Stock Charts TV YouTube channel. Don't forget to check out our Stock Charts channel as well. Some really cool historical documentaries and other footage that we are bringing to life to tell the story of market history through the charts. Also, to let you know, we have a big time summer sale going on right now at StockCharts.com. If you go to StockCharts.com slash special, you will find all the information on our uh, sudden, shocking, uh, and a uh, immediately urgent 
summer sale. Go to stockcharts.com slash special. You can find information on what you can do. If you've never joined as a premium member, now would be a really good time when you can lock in a really low uh, rate. And if you're an established member, you can actually extend your membership at the lower rate and push it out a bit further. So check that out, stockcharts.com slash special. Let's open the final bar mailbag. Thanks again, everyone, for all of your great questions. And let's get to question number one. Dave, does technical analysis work for ETFs and mutual funds? Which indicators tend to work? And I love that question so much. And hopefully uh, you can answer that question, many of you, from watching the show. We often refer to ETFs on the show. Um, trying to think. I didn't actually get to and many of them, maybe the Qs earlier today. But, you know, looking at sector ETFs like the XLV, looking at biotech like IBB and others, what's the real benefit, I think, of ETFs, besides the fact that it makes a lot of different markets and themes very accessible to individual investors, allows financial advisors to have a lot more levers to pull to get your clients in and out of different uh, investment themes. It also gives you some really good data to analyze groups and things. When I was first getting started in 2000, ETFs were kind of an emerging thing, but really not a uh, particularly widely uh, you know, used asset class relative to where we're at today. And it was still you know, sort of the mutual fund uh, era, maybe the end of that, uh, dominating uh, how individual investors have access to uh, different themes and different strategies. But one of the great benefits that I found early on is even when there wasn't a ton of liquidity, it gave you good price data. You could analyze how are these different sectors, how are these different groups. Nowadays, these different currencies, commodities, Bond markets, fixed income markets, non-U.S. markets, you can compare them all on a relatively apples-to-apples -apples basis because you have an ETF wrapper with which to analyze all of those uh, or many of those different asset classes. So I would say anything that you would use for a stock, you could absolutely use for a, an ETF. I've petitioned our founder, Chip Anderson, to rename the company Stock and ETF Charts. He's passed on that one. Um, so I, I don't see us making a major name change anytime soon. But I would say, I mean, if you want to think about stock charts as the stock and ETF chart platform, I think you are, yeah, that's a great approach. Because anything you can do on a stock, you can really do on an ETF because it is a, it is a group of stocks or things that trade like a, a, an underlying equity. And I think that's the, one of the great values. Now, mutual funds are a very different picture. I'm bringing up the Fidelity Magellan Fund. I used to work with uh, at Fidelity and worked with the managers of those funds. And, um, uh, and again, what's interesting about them is you have some good deep history on a lot of mutual funds. A lot of them have been run for uh, quite some time, have great performance data that you can break down. The challenge, or I guess one of the weaknesses of mutual funds, is they only print their values once a day, right? They print the net asset value at the end of every trading day. So you only get one dating point, data point, right? You don't have open, high, low, close like you do for an ETF. So if you're looking at a chart like this, where I'm looking at price and moving averages and RSI and relative strength, all of those things work just fine because they all only use closing prices, right? Moving averages are calculated usually off of closing price data. RSI is actually calculated based on closing prices as is relative strength. Now, you get into problems if you'd use an indicator like, um, let's see, DMI or the ADX line because those are based on uh, highs and lows. So anything that doesn't have highs and lows, anything based on average true range, isn't going to give you a particularly good uh, set of data because you don't have the highs and lows to work with. So you're limited a little bit in terms of the toolkit you can use for, uh, for mutual funds. If you have questions on what a particular indicator is using, just to make sure that you're not messing up in some way, what I would do is go to Chart School, bring up that indicator, or just click on the magnifying glass, type the name of the indicator. We'll give you the formula for all the indicators we have on our platform. You can see if it's just using Closing data or moving average data, that's all totally fine. Um, and you're going to find issues if you try to run a different indicator on something like uh, mutual fund. But that's the biggest difference between the two. And that's what I would keep in mind if you're trying to run uh, technical analysis on a mutual fund like Fidelity Magellan. Great question there, by the way, and thank you so much. Next question, how would you determine an upside objective for NVIDIA, NVDA? Obviously, a mega cap uh, uh, semiconductor stock in the technology space. I'm going to bring up... Uh, ACP. And, and I would tell you, if you're trying to do longer term objectives, the ACP platform is a really good place to look because you have a lot more flexibility. It's a dynamic charting platform. As a stock charts member, you have access to the sharp charts, which are the normal charts that I use, but also the ACP, the advanced charting platform, which is a really powerful uh, platform. We're just scratching the surface. So many cool things we're, we're doing and, and having development for, uh, for ACP and for stock charts as a whole. If I'm looking at the ACP platform, I'm bringing up the daily chart, which is this guy in the lower left. And what you can do is just click on the chart and move it around. You can click on the Y axis to kind of stretch things and sort of get things where you want to be. And the reason why I want to do that 
is because when a stock or an ETF is in an uptrend and you're sort of to new all-time highs, and the question is, now what, right? What's the upside objective after this? You really have a couple different uh, options, right? Option number one would be some sort of measured move. And what a measured move is, is basically this is what's happened so far, and I can use those movements to project where the next move might be. Common technique is to like a basing pattern, looking at the height of that pattern and uh, establishing that, sort of saying if this was the basing pattern on a chart like, um, I forget what's that, which one that was, DraftKings, I think, that had sort of that uh, cup and handle pattern. Now that we broke out, you can take the height of the pattern and project that as an upside objective. One of the tools that, that a lot of people use here is something like Elliott Wave, and a simple analysis of uh, NVIDIA might call this Wave 1 from the October low. This is a Wave 2 to the low at the end of last year. Maybe this is a big wave three, which means I need to patiently wait for a wave four. But once I get a wave four and I know where that's at, then one of the common uh, techniques in LA Wave is say wave one and wave three are often so what are, are, are equal. So if you do get a wave four, you can then take the height of this pattern, just draw a trend line, copy that trend line to the bottom of a wave four, and there's your upside objective. You could also use something like Fibonacci retracements for the same uh, for the same thing. Go to our annotations tool. You want to go to Fibonacci retracements. Click on that. You basically just click on a high and a low. You might have to move it around a little bit just based on what chart you're using and what levels you want to use. But those actually project levels above the current uh, data. And again, you might have to stretch the chart down to see some of the higher levels. Uh, but that's another one, basically saying, here's what happened up until now. So here's what may come next. So that is one whole bucket of approaches, which I would call measured moves, right? Meaning here's something that happened before. So here's where we might expect the end of the next move. I'm much more a fan of the trend following approaches, which says, I'm not going to be concerned about where NVIDIA stops. I just want to make sure I track that uptrend and recognize when the trend overall is rotating lower, right? So instead of trying to anticipate or guess at what level we might end, I'm just going to follow the trend. And as long as we keep making higher highs and higher lows, I'm just sitting back and enjoying the ride on NVIDIA and letting things go higher. When we stop that pattern, we break down through a chandelier exit, which is one I might uh, suggest to you that's where uh, I might want to uh, reverse. So those are the two main ways you can uh, come up with an objective, either number one, do a measured move, use something like Elliott Wave Analysis, Fibonacci Extensions is what you usually call that, to basically project higher potential levels. Uh, and then the other option is just um, move more into a trend-following approach and not worry as much about what objective we reach, but more about the trend going up to those levels and recognizing when the trend shifts. Great question there, by the way, and thanks so much for that one. Let's get to the third one. What indicators would you use to close a position? I didn't mean to mash up these questions right back in uh, b between each other, but uh, kind of plays along with what I was uh, what I was saying, right? Let's think about uh, looking at a chart like NVIDIA and wondering what do you do, right? Now that you have these amazing gains and now that we keep going higher, now what, right? At what point do you close a position? So I would say there's two, there's, there are a number of different ways, obviously, a number of different reasons why you would want to close a position. I'm going to assume for simplicity, we're talking about a long position in a stock like NVIDIA. So you're riding the price higher, you have a long position, you're sitting on paper profits. So um, the option is, you know, uh, again, liquidate when you hit some objective. I'm not a big fan of that. And I tell you why, because uh, I, I did think that way for quite some time. And if you're on a short, if you're a short term swing trader, you probably should think about that. And I would say one of the great things to do is look to the left on the chart. And, you know, if we're rallying off of the October low and you're sitting on a nice paper profit here and you're more of a swing trader, recognizing that we're rotating up to the previous highs, that would be where I would probably start to take profits on a swing trade. Because, you know, what are the chances that we're going to blow through that resistance and not have a meaningful drawdown? I would say probably pretty low. So if you're in a shorter term time frame, there are tools to bet on mean reversion. And I would focus on support and resistance. I would focus on Fibonacci levels as two good, interesting ways to sort of identify those potential turning points within a trend. Now, once you have something that's working over time, this is more about locking in profits, right? And more about a trailing stop sort of methodology. And there are a couple that I would think of. The, the most simple one that I would, I would do uh, is doing something like the 50-day or the 10-week moving average. On something like NVIDIA, as long as we remain above the 50-day moving average, things are not getting that bad. Now, sometimes we will break the 50 days. It's called a whipsaw, where you go below there and then rotate back up. That's the risk you're going to take in any sort of technical analysis that uh, it doesn't hit the signal exactly right and it doesn't play out. But overall, you know, uh, you know, starting to take some of the position off when we break a key level like that has often been a pretty good approach. 
The other one I would encourage you, and I mentioned this many times on the show, uh, Alexander Elder really popularized in one of his books the use of this technique called the uh, chandelier exits. He didn't create it, but he really popularized it. And what's great about this indicator is it is, a, it is a dynamic trailing stop based on average true range. And what average true range is, is basically the daily trading range, high to low, but adjusted for gaps. It's a common way of measuring volatility in, a, in an equity or in an ETF or any, any price data with intraday highs and lows. What this does is it dynamically adjusts the, um, uh, the stop based on the movement. So when the range expands, the, the stop gets a little bit wider. When we sort of collapse, the range comes in a little bit. It keeps bumping up the stop as the trend continues. And it's meant to not be too close, but not be too far. And that's the problem with something like a 50-day moving average. It's not super uh, sensitive. So if the stock starts fluctuating a lot, the 50-day moving average is going to look like nothing's happened because of the way it's calculated. A chandelier exit is going to be a little more dynamic. It's going to adjust based on the volatility of the uh, of the equity. So I would probably look at something like that. And again, hit the magnifying glass or the chart school section if you want to learn more or check out Alexander Elder's book, which of course, highly recommended, uh, fantastic uh, works on trading psychology. Let's continue on with our fourth question. Is this a potential, potential cup and handle pattern for LSCC? This is Lattice Semiconductor. And thank you so much. Uh, the person that wrote in the question, you included a permalink. As a reminder, the best way to get questions, I've had people send a lot of different things, images and PDFs, and I appreciate anything, but the best thing to do is just click below the chart where it says permalink. This will give you a little hyperlink. Copy and paste that right into your question. I'll know exactly what you're looking at. Within ACP, by the way, you have this little share button and you can share the active chart or you can share the entire layout because we allow you to show multiple charts. So if I'm showing this chart of um, uh, NVIDIA, this layout of these three charts, I could say share layout and then just copy that hyperlink. Again, put those, whatever you're using, put that hyperlink in the question. I'll know exactly what you're referring to. You're talking about LSCC, uh, Lattice Semiconductor, which is a, a now a large cap a semiconductor name. It's in the mid cap space for quite some time. And your question is, is this a cup and handle pattern? So, um, so loosely, I would describe this as a potential cup and, hold, cup and handle pattern. And the reason is for, for this, I'm going to draw on your chart. Sorry, it's like drawing on, uh, it's like eating someone else's lunch. So sorry for this, but um, I, it's my chart now because I saved your permalink, right? All right, so here we go. I'm going to take this uh, you know, neckline, right? So the rim of the cup. So a classic cup and handle actually kind of is flat to down a little bit. So you want it to be more, you know, think of it like a cup of coffee, right? You want it to actually look like a cup as much as possible, right? So you want to have the even rim. And then this is a bad example because the, the handle's a little lower, but you know what I mean, right? You want the, 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 uh, the two rims of the, the rim of the cup to be pretty even between the left side and the right side. This one's a little more uh, of an incline, right? Where the high of the uh, right side is about 10 points higher than the high on the left side. So what I would do as a stickler for uh, specifics in this case, I would draw the neckline like this, which means you're not quite above, you're not quite validating that uh, pattern. Now, having said that, I would certainly uh, give the, the benefit of the doubt to this being more of a constructive pattern than not. In that, we've had this rounded bottoming pattern. We're now putting in a clear high or low. I would just want to see a break above 97, which would take us above that high. For now, what's happened this week is we've traded right up to that level and then pulled back a little bit. I'll zoom in a little bit so you can see. We're looking at a lot of data here. This is a weekly chart, by the way, that you sent in here, which I really uh, appreciate looking at a little longer term chart. Yeah, here we go. So if we zoom in a little bit, you can see the big rounded bottoming pattern. Here's the high around 97. You can see we've traded right up to that level, but we failed. So I'd want to see at least sort of getting above 97, 98, which would take us above the right side of that cup and push higher. You know, technically, you'd have to draw the neckline like this, and it's not valid until it breaks above that, which means you'd have to be a little more patient uh, to go to uh, to the upside. So this is one of those things. I think a lot there's a, a lot of people have different theories on this. The the technical analysis literature really teaches you to be very specific about angles and levels. I have found to think a little more wiggle room is uh, is available. So that's how I would think about that particular potential cup and handle pattern. I would call it for now. Final question: When using Fibonacci retracements, how do you pick the high and low levels? I love this question because I get it uh, often in different uh, formats and in different forums uh, during presentations. A lot of times when I, when I show Fibonacci retracements, uh, I get questions on it. What you have to remember is it is a very subjective uh, analysis in a lot of ways, right? What levels you pick uh, have a lot of meaning. It has a, has a lot of importance. So you really need to define what are the important highs and lows to, uh, to use. You asked particularly about this chart, the NASDAQ 100 
And I'm going to make it a basic chart just to kind of give, get it uh, just on the price. And so I guess the question is, what do you sort of see as the overall trend? If you see the NASDAQ as topping here and you're looking for downside objectives, then what you have to do is say, OK, this down here in October of last year was the beginning of the move here. And I'm sorry, I'm fudgy. It's not perfect. But there's the beginning of the move. Here is the top of the move. What's 38.2% of the way down? So I'm basically saying this move is now over, and now I want to anticipate what some potential downside levels are. So it might be a little too early to declare this uptrend over. I think that's fair. But what you're saying here is if and when we rotate down, if and when I get a confirmed sell signal, now I have my objectives uh, in place. If you're more back here and you're saying, you know what, I'm actually down here at the October low, and I'm basically saying this was the high, in uh, January of last year, here's the low. Now, what are the key levels between there? And I'm focusing in on these levels. So that's basically saying, here's the downtrend. I'm looking for resistance on the way up. So the way that you pick the highs and the lows are to pick the levels that are most meaningful based on what you see as the progression of this uh, of this chart. And I should also say that Fibonacci retracements are super prevalent on shorter term time frames. It's up to you to think about what swings you're trying to capture, what time frames, what periods make sense for you in your analysis. So the longer, the short answer of uh, that long-winded one is to say it's really up to you. It's a subjective part of that toolkit. And I would say the extreme highs and lows on whatever time frame you're looking at are the place to start. Folks, we've got to wrap the show and go to the three and three, three charts in three minutes to tell the story of this market environment. Here is chart number one, the energy sector, XLE. You know, we were looking at uh, the, uh, uh, the sector returns in our Wrap the Week segment. We talked about how energy was showing some good strength uh, uh, today, up about 2%, just over 2%, while most sectors were, uh, were down, actually, for the day. And, uh, and, and any ones that were up were up a little, bit, a little bit less than this. What's important to me when you think about a stock or an ETF making a big move is take a step back. And again, my conversation with Marianne Bartels yesterday was really good about thinking about the relationship between the short-term price swings and the long-term trend. And, and her argument was the long-term trend is still positive. I can't disagree with that, right? We haven't seen enough deterioration to assume that any pullback is anything more severe than that. But I think the price would evolve to tell you that something's different. On something like the XLE, it's not about today's move. It's more about what today's move means within the context of the overall trend. I still see the XLE, by my read, as more negative than positive until we can start breaking above trendline resistance, right? Take the highs from January and April. We're kind of still below those levels. We get above there. We get above the 200-day moving average, which means the XLE gets above 82.50, maybe 83. Then you will hear me sing a very rosy tune about the upside potential for energy. For now, though, I still see this as a basing pattern that has not quite followed through. Chart number two, gold. I mentioned in our Wrap the Week segment about gold prices and uh, bouncing today. I just wanted to highlight uh, the chart of the GLD. We've covered the GLD and, uh, and the gold space many times in different, uh, in different uh, uh, areas. But particularly, I want to talk about this uh, rotation that we've seen from strength through uh, really the end of April, beginning of May, and then so showing some short-term weakness. What's happened in the last week or two is we have bounced off of support around 176. What's interesting about that level to me is that is the Fibonacci support level. Going back to our question about Fibonacci's, this is one of those examples, right? The rally from the November low to the May high, 38.2% of the way is 176. I see this as a potential bounce off that level. Also note the PPO indicator giving a buy signal. The last time we had a buy signal like this was in early March before we made a new swing high. I think this could be the beginning of a nice rotation in gold. What does that mean for other risk assets? That would be the big question uh, I would be trying to answer uh, at the moment. Finally, to finish off, I'll look at charts like Fifth Third. When I'm looking at the financial sector, also having a decent update, by the way, today and, uh, and doing better than, uh, than, the, uh, than the average sector. When you look at the XLF, though, I think there's still a lot to prove. You think about the energy sector and, uh, and again, thinking about that chart needing to get above trendline resistance. The challenge for a lot of these bank stocks, regional banks, uh, insurance companies, a lot of the stocks within the financial sector, even though I think there's an argument to be made about the upside potential, you really need to see them follow through to the upside. What's interesting, interesting to me now, though, is if you take a trend line just recently from the high in April, the high in June, you can see we're just starting to break above there. So with a lot of these charts, even though we're still at the lower end of the range for the last year or two, we're starting to make higher lows and we're starting to rotate higher. So when I'm thinking about what sectors have been struggling, where we may see emerging strength, 
places like energy, places like materials, certainly industrials, which have shown a lot of strength, and maybe something like financials. Higher rates could be an interesting tailwind, but I'd love to see the proof embedded in price itself. Not there yet. Folks, that's a wrap for this week. Thank you so much for joining us in this shortened holiday week and indeed every weekday after the close for our show. Some great interviews, also our specials earlier this week with the top 10 stocks for July 2023. Make sure you go through all of those previous videos, a lot of ideas and charts to uncover. For Stock Charts from Urban Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Have a great weekend. We'll see you next week.